Good afternoon. My name is Edward Mayo. I'm a Kennedy Scholar and candidate for the Master of Public Health in the Department of Health Policy and Management. I'm delighted to introduce Sir Michael Barber as a speaker for today's Voices in Leadership series. Sir Michael is a thought leader in education and has held a number of influential positions throughout a distinguished career spanning academia, government and business. Sir Michael is currently the Chief Ed Education Advisor of Pearson, the largest education company and largest book publisher in the world. He also chairs the Pearson Affordable Learning Fund, a $15 million fund which invests in companies providing high quality, scalable and low cost education solutions in the developing world. Sir Michael was head of the Prime Minister's Delivery Unit in the UK Government between 2001 and 2005, reporting directly to then Prime Minister Tony Blair. In this capacity, he was responsible for delivering major overhauls of the public ed education system and the National Health Service. He also developed the concept of the Delivery Unit, which directs effective implementation of government policy by cutting through traditional bureaucratic inertia. This approach was very successful in the UK and has been emulated in other countries around the world, notably in Malaysia. Prior to Pearson, he was a partner and head of McKinsey & Company's global education practice. He's written a number of major books and reports on education and was previously a professor at the University of London in the Institute of Education. He studied history at the University of Oxford and started his career by training as a teacher. In 2013, Dean Julio Frank appointed Sir Michael as Distinguished Visiting Fellow at Harvard School of Public Health. Before I turn the session over to Dr. Michael Sinclair, who will be moderating today, Please join me in welcoming Sir Michael Barber to the Voices and Leadership series at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Thank you, and I would also like to add my welcome, Michael, and to, uh, to all of you, and particularly also to our virtual audience, and to invite the virtual audience to send your questions to us via Twitter at VoicesHSPH at Voices HSPH, and we'd be delighted to have uh, your questions. Michael, I am truly intrigued as a product of a colonial outpost, British colonial outpost, by the idea that you are a knight of the British realm. And that, to me, conjures up you know, you jousting on weekends and having tea with the Queen. Is it quite like that? Uh, not quite like that. You do, uh, on uh, receiving a knighthood, get to go to the palace and meet the queen, and you do kneel in front of her, and she does put a sword on your shoulders. Uh, but the jousting bit, um, uh, I haven't attempted. Uh -huh. uh, so you don't get to hang out with William and Kate? Uh, no, no, I haven't had the opportunity to meet them, um, I'm afraid. But maybe one day. More seriously, though, um, it is the highest award in the UK for services to the nation. I believe Tony Blair said of your impact in his government that it was utterly invaluable. Uh, that is an extraordinary accomplishment, the kind of accomplishment that those of us in the ivory towers only aspire to. How do you make the transition from good ideas to practice, to policy and to practice? Well, well um, there's no simple answer to that, but the, probably the, the biggest moment for me of taking that um, step from ideas to implementation and practice was in 1997, so before the delivery unit, when I went to work in the Department for Education um, at the beginning of the Blair administration. And at that time in 1996 and 7, Tony Blair and his um, then education spokesperson and, and the first education minister in the Blair uh, uh, administration, David Blunkett, had been talking to me about what I wanted to do when they were elected, if they were elected. And I was basically offered the option of going into number 10 and being the Blair Education Advisor or going into the department. So they and knew you. They knew How me. did they know you? Well, I'd been, I'd been a professor of education for a while. And for the whole period between 1994, when Blair became leader of the Labour Party, and 1997, when he became prime minister, um, I was involved in the small group of people that invented what became New Labour's education policy. Okay. Uh, helping to write Blair speeches, writing policy documents. I think it's, it's fair to say we were better prepared, uh, I wouldn't say than anybody, but we were very well prepared for what we wanted to do if Labour won in 1997. So you were an activist academic? I was an activist academic, and I, I also, I, and I, I just, this is an important point, I, I also did um, things for the then Conservative government that were really, uh, I, I, so I was willing to be activist on behalf of any party that was doing the kinds of things I thought they yeah. should be doing. So for example, in 1995, it was a seminal moment in British educational history. 
the then government, the Conservative government, wanted to, for the first time ever, use law to intervene in an individual school because it was so bad. And I was on the, what the press called the hit squad that decided to decide whether to turn this school around or close it. Mm. There were five of us, but I was the only one that lived in the borough mm. where this school was. Um, and we decided to close it, and it was all over the newspapers. So I was, I was a, an activist in the sense that, although I was an academic, I really wanted to change, make, make things change. Right. Right. And in 1997, offered the option of being in the number 10 or going into the department. I chose to go into the department because that's where the implementation, that's where the, the you know, you were going to get oil on yeah, your fingers and, and actually yeah. try and make things happen. Yeah. And I'd never really done anything like that, but I'd read quite a lot of theory about it. And I'd also watched for, with fascination the Conservative government between the 1998 Education Act and 1997 trying to do implementation and getting some things right and some things wrong. So I thought, right, I'll go into the department and we'll just go for it and we'll see what happens and we'll be ambitious. And it looks, it was quite risky actually, but you, um, on the other hand, I was thinking I'm only gonna get one chance at this. And if I fail, I'll go Go away and I've learned something. (laughs) And if it succeeds, it'll be fantastic. Um, And it didn't all succeed, but lots of it worked. Um, And it was a very exciting time. So that's when I began to learn. And it was the result of that that I then, in 2001 was asked by Tony Blair to set up a delivery unit. I'd been debating with his team how to get number 10 to work more effectively on where, delivery. Where did this delivery unit come from? That was his idea or it yours? Was, I, think, I think we, he and I, we both uh, like to claim credit for it, but I think he and I agree that it was my idea. And um, <laughs> uh, uh, For the record. Yeah, um, <laughs> but you can ask him. But, the, but, but basically what, what I kept saying to the number 10 policy unit that existed in the first term and that was, um, you know, we in the education department were often interacting with. I, I said to them, kept saying, you don't ask me all the right questions. You ask me, have you got any new ideas? And I'll always have new ideas, but you never really check, did I implement the last one thoroughly? And we took the initiative in the education department because we thought it was a good way of getting um, Tony Blair's focus. We took the initiative of asking them to review our progress every um, couple of months. And it, so just it, that, to explain, well. the, the, the delivery unit is a dedicated team of people committed to making sure that the government's programs and policies are being yeah. implemented according to set targets. Yes, yeah, so, so, so uh, and at that, that time, in the first player term, and everybody accepts this, the, the policy unit didn't really do that. It, it did some great things and it was a very uh, talented group of people, but it didn't routinely check were things getting mm-hmm. done. Mm-hmm. So I wrote them a proposal before the 2001 election and said, look, you could this is how you could do it. You could have a, um, you could a- agree plans, and then you could have stock takes, which we'd uh, developed in the first term in education. And he, Tony Blair could use a small amount of time really effectively to monitor implementation of his priorities. So did it, it work? And then, th- so they, they then decided they would do that. First, I thought it was an adaptation of the policy unit, but then we decided it was a separate thing. And um, in 2001, Blair won the election again Basically, the British people said to him, we like the speeches, we like the direction, we like the economic growth, um, and we like what you're trying to do with the health service and reducing crime and so on, but we haven't actually seen much change on the ground. Yeah. And so Blair, you know, there's this moment in, in Britain when you get an election and the Prime Minister stands on the, in front of the number 10 door and makes a short speech, and all Prime Ministers in that circumstance try to be humble, at least for that uh, few minutes. Mm-hmm. And. Um, <laughs> M- Margaret Thatcher famously in 1979 quoted St. Francis of Assisi at that moment and then, <laughs> and then forgot about him for the next 11 years. But, the, but, in, but, in, but in Blair's case, he says, I've now got a mandate for reform and an instruction to deliver. And a few days later, he said to me, can you set up this delivery unit because I'm passing the, man, the, the, yeah. the, the instruction to deliver on to you. Yeah. And yes, it, 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 broadly speaking, so, we think so it was a great reform. Blair, I assume, typifies what I think you generally refer to as purposeful, a purposeful leader, a purposeful leadership, <coughs> somebody with a sense of mission, a vision, and the purpose to actually make it happen. But you gave him the roadmap. Yeah, yes, I think that's true uh, in, in broad terms, uh, not, not just me, uh, but, and, and he learned a lot. I think one of the things we forget about politicians uh, who get elected is it takes a while to learn how to run a government. We, we, that the media can tend to assume that because you've won a campaign, suddenly you know how to run a government. They're two very, very different activities. You see it again and again with American presidents and British prime ministers. They have to learn. And by two th- the year 2000, roughly, according to Blair's memoirs, and I, I think uh, it stands up, he had really learnt that 
if you were going to get things done, it wasn't just about speeches and white papers and the message and legislation. You actually had to have a kind of technology, a system for making sure things got done. Mm -hmm. And you, the, the health service reform that was proposed in the year 2000, the 10-year plan, that was where he realized we really need to do something. And they'd seen that we'd made progress in education, and he put the two together. Yeah. And but he did I'm, have a I'm, real purpose, absolutely. Yeah. He was very, per so at the beginning of his second term, I'm going to reform the public services. That's my mission. That yeah. I want that to be my legacy. I'm going to get it done. And your delivery unit is the, me the means, the mechanism okay. that will make it happen. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm very interested in this concept of the backroom leader. Yeah. Uh, you know, we all know the public figures, but behind those public figures are the people who really make the wheels turn. Um, how did you play that role? The, I mean, I think it is, so I learned a lot about doing that, obviously, and I'd learned a lot in the four years previously. Um, but the, the, cru the crucial thing was, I said to Blair right at the beginning, on the, literally on the day he was asking me if I'd do it, that uh, I can only do this if you will pay attention throughout the whole term. I don't need a lot of your time. I'm going to organize that time properly. And when I ask for your time, I needed to give it to me. But I won't ask very often. But if I ask, it means it's serious. Mm. And we did that deal. And, and he basically did pay attention right through the time. And then what I think, looking back on it, I think there was a real piece of self-knowledge, which I think is critical for a, a purposeful leader. You have to know what you're good at. Um, and there's lots that he was good at. And you have to know what you can't do, but you can get other people to do for you. And bringing system and data and routines into the way things worked was what I did for him. The other thing is you have to, you're being a leader, but you don't want to get, go out and get public credit. You're organizing it so that other people get the credit. Exactly. Blair, obviously, but also that if we make progress on health or crime, the Minister of Health or the Home Secretary gets mm -hmm. the credit. Mm -hmm. So you're being a backroom leader. So humility is important. And then absolute persistence. A very, very crucial moment for me was September the 11th, 2001. Obviously, it was crucial for, for uh, millions of people around the world. Blair had been about to deliver a speech and then came back when he heard what was happening. And that afternoon, UK afternoon, I passed his office. And there were lots of people in that room. There were people who knew about transport, people who knew about um, uh, security, people who were, um, I, I guess, from the Secret Services, all kinds of people milling around the Prime Minister, communications people. Mm. And my instinct was to go in there and say, how can I help? Mm. But I didn't do that. I realized in that moment that my job was to keep the public service reform show on the road. And that from that moment on, I knew that whatever distractions came up, my job was to keep doing okay. the agenda that we had agreed in June of that year. It was now September. And I stuck with that for four years. And Blair used to say to me, the great thing about the delivery is I know that whatever I'm doing, whatever crisis comes up, and we had the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, all the way through that time. Whatever I'm doing, I know you're doing the things that right. I care about and the British people right. care about. And my slogan back to him was, delivery never sleeps. We're 24 hours a day on your case. Yeah. Uh, leaders don't always play nice, though. Um, and, and I believe it's also been said of you that you were the least Machiavellian of an intrigued, riddled government. <laughs> Famously, you got on with both Prime Minister Brown and the uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer, at least Chancellor Exchequer Brown and, and Tony Blair, the Prime Minister, um, who were often at loggerheads. Um, talk to us about how you manage these different leadership styles and how their leadership styles were different. Well, one, one, um, just one piece of context. I had a Quaker upbringing. This is, this is relevant because my, my, my father was a pacifist. You learn a lot about um, thinking th through from other people's perspectives, uh, reflecting, um, trying to get peaceful reconciliation of contrasting views through a Quaker education, the Quaker upbringing. That, and that it had helped when I was working in a teacher union, and certainly, but, it, but it really came through in this. The other thing is, when people, once people stop thinking that you're trying to promote your own career, and you're actually trying to get a job done, mm. they, they listen to you. Mm. So they don't think Michael's just doing this because he wants to get X or Y. Mm. He really wants to get the job done. But some of it is, like one way to a, not appear Machiavellian is to be kind of super Machiavellian. Mm. Um, and you need to, so I, I read a lot about what other units set up by Downing Street had done and then did the opposite. Mm. So they tended to, um, 
ask for big budgets. I'd ask for a small budget. Uh, they tended to get more, get people and try and add more and more people. I didn't do that. I put a cap right at the beginning on the number of people. I would, and then they tended to be kind of flavor of the month and then become part of the bureaucracy. Whereas I said to all the top officials in week one, I'm going to try and abolish the delivery union in three years. And if you don't want it to exist after three years, I'll go away and do something else. Mm -hmm. So I intentionally defied the stereotypes. And then we set out an agreement with all the officials and the ministers, we will behave like this and we won't behave like this. And I said to any, if, if any of my staff are on the we won't do this list, I will stop that activity immediately. So that's my deal with you and I'll come and see you in three years and if you don't like what we're doing, yeah. I'll go and do something yeah. else. And that created a, people were kind of surprised by that. Um, and you can call it Machiavellian or not, but it was basically establishing that we're here to get the job done, we're not trying to promote our careers, we're not trying to create a permanent part of the bureaucracy, um, and we won't take any credit for anything we do. Or we won't actively take If you give us credit, we'll welcome it, but we're not looking for it. Yeah. Besides the rivalry between Blair and, and Brown, I mean, obviously both are extremely accomplished and talented leaders in their own right, but very different. How would you define those differences? Well, well um, uh, the, the the rivalry came from, you know, in the end, from from political ambition and sometimes small but sig very significant disagreements over policy. And but, but but when Gordon was Chancellor, he needed to make sure that the biggest increases in public expenditure in British history actually delivered results. Yes. And the Treasury didn't have a technology for doing that, and so I had to build a relationship with Treasury officials within the Gordon. So he trusted us as people who would do help him do delivery. He allocated the money, he set some goals, but what happened in between until then had been left to the department and now we were monitoring that on the, the key priorities and Gordon uh, came to trust and understand the process. I think I'd, char I'd characterize their difference as leadership style that um, to Tony was, um, He's a brilliant communicator, but he also built, and I experienced this daily in number 10, a fantastic team of people who were uh, collaborative, liked working with him, uh, there were some big egos around, but, but basically we were all committed to the mission um, and we were in a period of growth and we were on an upward trajectory. Um, Gordon is um, actually more like um, normal human beings. He agonizes over things. He uh, worries about things, has these big visionary moments, but then uh, quite a lot of anxiety about getting things done. Brilliant on policy, but kind of worrying about all those things. And then uh, th there's some stuff on the record about the, the way the team operated when he became Prime Minister that um, doesn't need repeating here, but really didn't work. And that sense of we're on a mission, we've got momentum, um, uh, and we've got a great team that will help deliver it, I think was missing in number 10. Having said that, Gordon did make a couple of major interventions in the financial crisis that if he hadn't done, I'm talking globally, not just Britain, you know, we, we may not have, you know, things may have yeah. been a lot worse yeah. than they were. So he had, he had moments of brilliance. Yeah. Sadly, um, leaders only get credit for the results, not for the effort. Um, results really matter. And I think this is something that uh, you're very strong on. Is that something you talked to Tony Blair about? Yes, a lot. So, so I mean, and, and actually interesting. But if you look at Blair's career, he, he got, you know, it was, it was, he, he got a super re-election in 2001. Lots of credit, even though actually, if you look at the results of the first term, they're much more mediocre than the second term. The second term, we really delivered, but the credit he got was much less. There'd been the Iraq War that was unpopular in, in large parts. So it's really the results really matter, but election results aren't decided just by results. What we used to say in the delivery is the results matter to the British people regardless of the election result and we're going to try and improve the healthcare system, make sure you don't wait too long, we, uh, we're going to help uh, drive big cuts in crime, we're going to try and get the trains to run on time. So we were really focused on results and for that you need clear targets. Targets are controversial in British politics but you have to have them, you can, you can call them something else. Like David Cameron, um, who I think has uh, done a reasonable job as Prime Minister, started off saying he was totally against targets and within two months I heard him on the radio saying I'm going to make Britain a top five destination for tourists. Now you don't have to call that a target, but it is a target. <laughs> and um, so governments have to set targets. If you want ambition, if you want big change, you have to set ambitious targets, but then you have to have a plan and you have to have a way of tracking progress towards that, which generally means data systems of some kind and being in touch. And that's basically what we put in touch for Tony Blair. We put the routines in place, which meant that the crises didn't prevent progress. 
we got the data systems to work, which we reported regularly to, to Blair uh, and uh, periodically to the Cabinet. And when the data revealed problems, it meant we were identifying things going wrong before there was a crisis, and we yeah. solved the problem. And we were always committed to achieving the goal. And he was always responsive to your change of direction if that was needed. He he was he was always open to it. He he, he, he you know some, sometimes you debate it, and often it was a debate we, in the stock tech meeting. There'd be Blair on one side of the table and the Minister of Health on the other, or whichever minister it was, and a handful of people. Um, on each other table and we would do genuine problem solving and we had an agreed evidence base. I can't emphasize how important getting the data is. It sounds boring. Bean counters are kind of de derided. Bean counters are really important. Y you, can, you can make your best Henry V inspirational speech on the day before the Battle of Agincourt, but if the soldiers don't have boots and they haven't got their bows and they haven't got their arrows, they're going to lose the battle against the French, however good your speech is. Somebody's got to count the beans. We were doing that and we were getting really good data. And the key thing, this is a bit that gets missed in governments, the key thing with data is you've got to get it in real time. You've got to ask the right questions of it and then you've got to present it so that even a prime minister can understand it. And these things, you've got to do right. all three of those things. And then you've got to deal with the bureaucracy. So how do you yeah. overcome you know, the institutional resistance to change, bureaucratic inertia? Yeah, well, and th that's, that's huge in most governments. And at the beginning, the British mandarins beautifully captured in um, Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister, those famous <laughs> series, that they were thinking, well, this unit isn't going to work. We've seen off units like yeah. this before. Um, so you have to kind of find a way of um, making them think you're different. So I, I described a few minutes ago how we set out to be quite different from any other unit. And then when they realized we had a really good team of people, I'm a big fan of small teams of great people who are committed to a mission. So the delivery unit was a small team with a real purpose. When they saw that we were helping them solve problems that were on their desk, they, they appreciated that, especially as we were giving them the credit with their minister and the prime minister. So we'd say, so-and-so permanent secretary of such and such department has solved this problem. Then they begin to think, oh, this is, this is okay. The other thing they really liked is number 10 changed from something that kept asking for a new idea every few weeks to a real persistent drive. So the agenda stayed the same. And part of my job, my commitment to the departments was we're asking you for this outcome now in 2001. It'll be the same in 2002, the same in 2003. We're going to persist with this. And persistence is a great part of of serious leadership if you're talking about change on the ground. And as you've worked around the world, um, are there other leadership qualities that have jumped out at you as you've met different leaders in different capacities? I think, I, th I, I mentioned it a few minutes ago, I think self-knowledge, no, no, none of us, um, whether we become leaders or not, can know, can be good at everything. So knowing what you're not good at and then finding people to do it for you and with you, I think is really important. I think the great political leaders, and in a time of rapid change such as the one we're living through, the great political leaders need to be able to level with people about what globalization will mean. I think Blair was very, very good. Blair's best speeches and constantly repeated refrain, refrains about how the world is changing and we need to be ahead of that game were really important. I think countries run into trouble when their leaders don't have the courage and the capacity and the language to explain the world we're in and how it's changing. I think of it as if you're in a balloon over a landscape, you can see what's coming ahead of you and you've got time and the great leader can spell that out, but they can also know that to change what's coming, you need to be on the ground, in the weeds, getting a, paying attention right. to detail. Right. The one of the things I really hate in strategy books, and this is a lesson for the, for the students who read all these books about leading and what, what leaders and strategy, and it says, um, leaders do big strategy and leave the detail to others. Absolutely not true. <laughs> you've got to be, you can't be on top of all the detail because you don't have time. You've got to know which details to pick on. You've got to have somebody who really does know the detail and you've got to have somebody counting the beans and reporting to you what's happening. Mm -hmm. Let's take a few questions. I'm sure people would like to uh, talk to you as well. Are there questions in the audience? Yeah, go ahead. Hello there, thanks so much, Sir Michael. Um, I'm John Hintzey, I'm a visiting student at the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. Um, there's a former special advisor called Dominic Cummings who used to work for Michael Gove in the Department of Education, and one of his critiques of the civil service is it's not reflective enough. You've talked a lot about 
how you're trying to get things on the ground, but haven't talked a lot about civil service reform. Yeah. So it's quite easy for a civil servant perhaps to be obsequious, to make his boss think he's doing a good job or not, and he's not. And so I was wondering if you could talk about what you'd like to see in civil service reform, maybe bringing in more experts, having people not change departments so often, or whatever you think. Yes, look, look so, so civil service reform is, is, is an important um, aspect of this, and you're right, I haven't mentioned it so far. What, what, what I think Blair would admit that in his first term he didn't understand the Im sufficiently the importance of changing the way the civil service operated to get the delivery that he wanted. Um, so for example, there were, there were swathes of government commitments for which there was no plan. There were swathes of um, specified targets for which there was no data system to count the progress towards it. So you, know, you, you would think that if you set a target to reduce waiting times, the civil service would be thinking, well, and how, how do I collect the data on that? How do I make sure it's working? Actually, the Department of Health did do that. But, but you know, we, we had commitments to cut crime, but no way at the national level of knowing what the 43 police forces were doing. You'd think that would be automatic, but it wasn't automatic. And I think what, what we did in the delivery unit was provide a challenge to the civil service, but we got the tone of it right. Um, so we, we weren't running around like in the West Wing and banging the table and saying the Prime Minister is, even I is incandescent or he's furious or whatever, <laughs> even, even if he sometimes was. We went around saying, well, hang on, how are you going to change this? How are you going to get it done? Can we help you? Have you seen these, this part of the civil service over here that's already done something like this? Why don't you go and talk to my another? It's another department. And, get it. and then around the delivery priorities, we were, we were making sure that permanent secretaries put good civil servants with a good track record and kept them in the post for a significant period of time. And uh, what I'm, I'm always cautious about with governments is civil service reform has some kind of big agenda in itself. I'd rather reform the civil service to deliver some specified outcome. So that's what we want to do. How do we need to change the civil service to get it done? Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a lot in, in what I've written about this. Um, but getting the civil service to focus on delivering some outcomes, doing good plans, which you'd think they were good at, but we found they were frustratingly poor at. They could write essays, they could put glossy covers on essays and send you a beautiful report, but they couldn't do a real operational plan that had coffee stains on the corner and marmalade because they'd been checking it that morning over breakfast. You know, that's what you want, real operational plans that says we're going to do this by that date and this is the person responsible. So there was a thing about planning and then getting data systems. And it's true that w what you, you quoted Dominic Cummings, it's true that uh, I think un until I even now, parts of the civil service process are kind of um, assumed, they're built into the way they work, but they're not conscious and they're not specifically improvable because they haven't been described. There is now a, a, a trend towards doing that. We, w we in the delivery, for example, for a stock take is a simple thing. It's a, an hour long meeting between a prime minister and a minister to review progress. We defined a stock take. We knew exactly what that was like. We had a website with them on. Somebody on my staff was it responsible, not just for the, you know, the people responsible for each stock take, but they were responsible for improving stock takes in general. And they'd be consulting people, how did that work? How can I make it better? So, so by making it explicit, we made it improvable. And this is a really important part of the process of delivery. But how did you get the civil servants on board? Um, well. One thing you, you need to do, the, the, on the whole, the, the British Civil Service, and I think this is generalizable, wants to do stuff that a government with power and influence wants to do. And so the, the united ministerial team cabinet led by Blair, that was an important part of it. Showing them how to do things, giving them credit for doing it. Um, and, but most importantly, when they did the things that we advised them to do, they found it really rewarding. So if you like, like, like a, cl a classic example is that there was a group of people whose job it was to reduce road congestion. And they were just thinking this is impossible. And w we said, well, how do you collect the data? They said, well, we have 12 people who drive around the country and call in every year or two and say it's getting worse. <laughs> so this is true. I know this is on the record. So, so we said, well, what about the GPS? What about global positioning system? Supposing you could count every minute and every hour of what was happening on Britain's motorways, interstate highways you call them in America, or on the A roads. And six months later we had that and they resisted that idea because they said it's going to be expensive, we'll never use it. But once they got it, 
they could monitor progress, they could intervene, they knew what caused road traffic, uh, you know, uh, what caused traffic delays. Suddenly the system became manageable. Similarly, on crime, once we got the data collection system that allowed you to compare the 43 police forces, we could get the civil servants saying, well, how come Liverpool's cut street crime and Bristol hasn't? Your job becomes doable, and that's the most important aspect of this, because it then becomes quite intoxicating. You think, I'll wait for the next set of data and see what we can do then. Mm -hmm. We had exactly the same experience in Punjab in Pakistan, just to show that this isn't British, purely British, where once we got the monthly data collection from 60,000 schools, at the beginning the civil servants were totally sceptical about it, and then uh, by the end they were the biggest enthusiasts because suddenly the job was doable. And I think that's, you have to get to people, there's a, there's a big mistake that people make in leadership. You think you win hearts and minds and then get the action, but actually really you have to do both at once. You have to get the action because you can only win the hearts and minds by showing people how the different looks and feels. And so you empowered them in a sense, uh, and they, they, they yeah. felt better for it. Yes, <laughs> and plus they get their, you know, we, the, the civil servants in charge of these programs, when they began to deliver, they were in the stock take, and we'd say to them, well, you present this to Tony, yeah. and to uh, the Prime Minister, and, and, and so credit. they get the credit, they get the moment of glory. For some of those civil servants, that's their one time when they ever sat in the number 10 cabinet room and presented to the Prime Minister. They'll remember it forever. Yeah, were there some who you couldn't win over? Uh, yes, sure. and and, and um, a quiet word with a permanent secretary and somebody could be moved. So absolutely, they're, they're, they're either, <laughs> oh, yeah, look, 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 let's not pretend it's all easy. You know, there's, there's, some, there's some hard pieces of this uh, and people who were unwilling or not up to the job, you have to, you can't usually fire a civil servant totally, but they can be moved to, to other less important tasks that they might be better at. Aha, uh -huh. that's the trick. More questions, yes. Hi, uh, my name is Rosa. I'm an MPH uh, health policy student here at the school and also a writing fellow at the Harvard Public Health Review. Um, I want to steer the discussion to health just for a little while. Um, in the context of America, uh, where patients uh, are viewed as consumers with a lot of autonomy to choose their providers as well as their health insurance plans, as someone who's worked at the health policy arena as well as the education policy arena, do you see a role for health literacy and improving health literacy of the public as a potential tool to improve health outcomes somewhere like America? By health literacy, I'm assuming you mean knowing more about health and what makes for good health in your life. Yes, yeah, sometimes financial literacy combined with that as okay. well to make these choices more informally. Well, look, I think one of, I think one of the um, very important trends around the world is um, exactly in that direction. So I, I think, if you like, the twi uh, so I'm not an expert on health in the way that you are, but the, the, the 20th century model of health healthcare system, or second half of the 20th century, where basically um, it's assumed you're well, um, and then when you get ill, hospitals fix you. I'm slightly exaggerating. <laughs> that 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 um, that model is um, uh, both um, not sufficiently effective um, uh, and it's too expensive. And so, um, getting people to know more about how to manage their own health, to decide what what they eat, what exercise they do, what they what they do or don't drink, what they do or don't smoke, all of these things are really important parts of of the future. And I think. Um, was a debate we had in the, in the Blair administration where we used to talk about our policy when in, got summarized as schools and hospitals. But the health people were saying, well, hang on, it's not really about hospitals anymore, or not so much. And it took a while to move on to the whole broader public health and what you're calling health literacy. But I do think that's important. It's also very important in the developing world. You still see lots of developing world countries thinking that health policy is about building more and more hospitals. Um, but actually, it's about these things. So I, I, I do think that's important. And in America, obviously, the, f the financial literacy that goes with it is important if you don't have a fully funded public health care system. And I, I mean, just as a, ge a general principle, I think choice for citizens is um, both good and probably, it, depending on the service, is good for outcomes because uh, that brings some competition. So I think I, I'm in favor of choice, but you want that choice to be as well informed as possible. Um, and so if you think there are citizens that you're going to offer choice to who won't have the information available, making it available, finding ways of giving them access to that information, and giving them advice where they need it, I think was important. And we did do that in the Blair Health Reforms when we said when you're diagnosed and you need an operation, you can choose a hospital anywhere in the country where you can go. 
and if you want you can access this choice advisor who will help you make that decision that's what we were thinking about were your reforms in education and health in particular uh, sustained post Blair um, broadly um, I think on education the the yeah, they've definitely been sustained, and indeed the, the current Conservative government um, l led at education level by um, a very charismatic politician called Michael Gove until recently really took the Blair agenda and drove it hard. Um, it wasn't perfect, but I think he got a lot done, and it's really built, and it's made those reforms irreversible. I think on health, um, I'm not sure what the current Conservative uh, co coalition government would say, but they... I think they um, probably lost some momentum on health care, uh, whereas I think what they inherited was a system that was actually working quite well. I think they'll get it back on track. And interestingly, the head of the National Health Service was, was the health advisor to Blair. The current head, Simon oh, Stevens, was was Blair's health advisor back when we when I was in the delivery unit. And he's the best person you could possibly appoint. He's spent time here in between those two things. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he's the best person you could possibly have doing that health reform. Ah, interesting. More questions? Yes, sir. Hello. Um, Jacob West, another Brit, I'm afraid. Um, I'm a visiting fellow at the School of Public Health, also worked under the last two Labour Prime Ministers. Uh, Michael, very interesting talk. Um, just wanted to get your reflections on how you might apply the sort of what might be perceived as quite a centralist delivery approach in a world in which increasingly, particularly in the UK, we're trying to deliver public services more from the bottom up, lots of reforms in healthcare, giving hospitals more autonomy. In fact, the whole NHS is itself meant to have more autonomy. Uh, indeed, in education, similarly, with free, free schools and academies and so on. Does it still work in an environment where you've got that kind of approach? There's no delivery unit anymore, uh, as I understand it. Uh, how is this government trying to approach that? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I just want to start with a point of general principle here. I say this um, often, that the road to hell is paved with false dichotomies. Um, and, you know, the, the very, there are very few re reforms that are totally centralizing or totally um, bottom up, and the, the success, or very few successful ones. And the successful ones are probably going to be a combination of both. Uh, of the both. Michael Gove, who uh, the outgoing education secretary, now chief whip in the current coalition government, he completely understood that in order to create greater school autonomy, he needed a powerful central drive from the department because in order to get the devolution, you need the, the central power. When we were in the Blair, when I, uh, I was working for, for Tony Blair and doing the health reforms, we completely understood that to bring in private providers of knee and hip operations wasn't going to happen up happened bottom up it would have been resisted by the NHS which was a monopoly provider to break the monopoly you needed the power of the center so so the one of the ironies uh, and the, the, is that to get effective devolution and greater autonomy at the frontline level you have to have a powerful center to make that happen the two went together and even if you devolve it uh, devolve everything out if you're a prime minister that you and you've made some commitments to the electorate that you're going to do x y and z or you whatever it might be, you still need to track progress towards delivery. And if it's not working, you need to be saying to the um, autonomous body, well, we, we made a commitment to this and we've given you the autonomy to do, but here's the evidence. What are you going to do about it? So I'd, I've never seen, I know, I know there, was a, there was a critique of uh, what I did a, a, in the Blair administration that it was a very centralizing. I don't see it as a centralizing thing. I just it's seeing government from the center because you're in number 10, but it's not centralizing in its impact necessarily. You can choose whether you want to devolve or whether you want to centralize, you can drive it from the center. But you know, in the end, if you're going to deliver health outcomes or reduce crime, whichever your strategy, you need to check you need to have the data to know whether it's working or not. Um, I'll, I'll, actually, I'll give you a, a, an example from history. So I was looking, because well, I've I, I just finished writing something about this, and. Uh, the routines that we established in the Blair administration of the, the stock take that came around every two months if you were health secretary or uh, to every two months if you were home office um, was important. And then every month there was a note to Blair on the health reforms, a note to Blair on crime, a note to Blair on education. Those routines are really important for driving progress. And again, that's not centralizing, it's just, it's just putting in place, making sure that the Prime Minister is informed whether your reform is centralizing or not. But the, the, the anecdote is this, MI5 in the war, 1943, 
were worried that Churchill wasn't paying them enough attention. They had exactly the same debate that we had, which is how do we make sure Blair stays interested? And the answer was, well, we'll write him a monthly note, we'll make sure it's really well written, um, and we'll make sure it has some compelling data in it, and it goes on a routine basis. So they start doing it. They decided, because they wanted it well written, they decided they were going to get their best writer to write it, and it was a guy called Anthony Blunt. Um, Anthony Blunt, it, became out, it turned out in the 1970s, was a Russian spy. So the, the amazing thing about the monthly note to Churchill from MI5 in the war is that it was cleared by the Russian Secret Service before it went to Churchill. <laughs> that is incredible. Our note was much more boring than that. Um, but, but the monthly I think the note, Russians read it anyway. <laughs> uh, uh, make, make, they, they made, they, they, of course, at that time, Russia and Britain and America were, were uh, temporarily allies. But, but even so, it's, it's an incredible thing. And they, they were just thinking about how to do that. And their notes are much more interesting now as they say, you know, we've identified um, 140 uh, German spies, 24 of them have been turned around and an I double agent, 17 have been eliminated, you know, whatever it is. It's all, the, the monthly note is in the history of MI5 if you want to look it up. But the, my point is, you need routines and you need to inform the Prime Minister and if the Prime Minister or the government is trying to deliver something, whether it's devolution, whether it's greater autonomy, they need to know whether that's happening or not. And if it is happening, that's great. And if it isn't happening, they need to do something about it. I don't you, think it's centralizing. You have been called the control freaks, control freak, <laughs> <laughs> among other things. You know, I, could, I could go on. My favorite here is Mad Professor's Gone Global yeah. uh, from some of your friends in the United States yeah. um, who've welcomed you here. Um, how do you deal with contrary opinions? It's, it's interesting. I've, I've been called all, all those things. I'm on a website here in the United States as the seventh most scary person in American <laughs> education reform. Um, Arnie Duncan, by the way, is eighth. So I'm quite, quite proud of being on this. Um, uh, but but the, the point that the, 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 what I always found in those, I mean, it's not much fun being criticized like that. Um, you can laugh somebody off. The most important thing, and I'd say this to the, to the students if you're thinking about leadership positions, the most important thing is that you've got your base covered. In the end, and this is part about being the leader, the, 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 the leader in the shadows, in the end, Blair is, I'm, I'm working for Blair. So if Blair's happy, it doesn't matter what they think out there because I'm doing the job for Blair and Blair is where my power emanates from. He's the, he's the person who was elected. I'm just a, an official. And that gives me my opportunity to change uh, the lives of the British citizen. The same in Punjab where sometimes the education reform gets criticized. But as long as the chief minister is happy, trusts you, believes in it, you just have to go through that. And, and you're not going to make any big change in the public service without being criticized. If, if, if everybody loves you, you're almost certainly not making that much difference. So I think you just have to be ready to go through that. Are we doing the right things? What's the evidence saying? You usually know sooner than people out there whether this really will work. You go through a period where you're being criticized, and in the end, it comes through. Sometimes you have to wait till long after you've gone. There's now academic evidence showing that the way the delivery unit approach things is you know, stands up because you compare England to Scotland and Wales on health reform and England comes out better. Yeah. But we didn't know that then, but you just have to do what you believe in and ensure that your base is covered. You're, you know, in the end, if, if Blair's losing confidence in you, obviously you've then got a problem. Yeah. I think we have another question here somewhere. Yes, sir. Hi, my name's George Greenbury. I'm an EDEM candidate at the Harvard School of Education. Please forgive the facial hair ensemble. I'm at a uh, theatre production in the lobe at the moment. <laughs> um, you've talked a lot about targets. My question is uh, fairly simple. Um, how can you make specific targets generate general improvement? And to give a concrete example, um, the 5A star to C, including English and Maths, um, GCSE target for students in the UK, um, drove improvement in that area um, for a number of years. Um, but I had the misfortune of starting my career in a school which had, um, as part of the Teach First programme, prioritised that at the detriment of things like all sport within school. They uh, actually cut out, ironically, um, a huge number of GCSE options so they could offer BTEC equivalencies um, and therefore narrowed the kind of curriculum they were offering. And so I'm not sure how how much education or education provision in that school improved generally despite that specific target which was improving. Yeah. Um, so how can you kind of ensure that? Well, I, I mean, it's a, it's a very important question. The, question. the question basically is about when you set targets and use particular data systems, 
uh, what do you do about the gaming of it? I don't want to get into a debate for a global audience about uh, about the details of the British um, uh, qualifications at 16, although um, it's a perfectly uh, interesting debate and it's a good question. I think the, 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 the when you, first of all, being thoughtful at the point of constructing a target, how ambitious do you want to be? When do you want the deadline to be? What data are you going to use to check it? Uh, what might the negative consequences be? be and how do you check whether those are occurring or not. What we found in the delivery unit looking across the board was that sometimes when you set a target, there, or of course there are lots of people who don't want the target set, they don't want the pressure that will come from the target and they come up with all these things that are going to go wrong. So we would say to them, okay we'll check whether that's going wrong. So you'd say to the police we want to cut street crime, they'd say yes you can do that but if you do all the other crimes will get worse. We say we'll check. And then what we discovered is the people who cut street crime fastest also cut the other crimes fastest. So we can blow out that as an urban myth. And um, so, so you, you constructing the target, the degree of ambition you want, um, and the, the mechanism or the data system you're going to use to check it is important. And then predicting where the gaming might occur and checking it. The other thing is to, to prove real improvement, you need to see what's happening on indicators that are nothing to do with your own indicator system. So I'll give you an example from the first Blair term. We set a target to improve literacy for by age 11, for, for, for 11 year olds by 2002. Um, and we actually, we, we made a lot of progress towards the target, but missed it, it was a very ambitious target. How do we know that was real improvement? Um, well, one, we, had, we, we audited the data collection system, but two, the international comparison showed England going from being like 17th in the world in 1995 to third in the world in 2000 on a sample test taken among 10 year olds, so not 11 year olds, a totally different data system. Now you've got two data systems pointing in the right direction, you say that's almost certainly real improvement. So what I, I think governments need to look for alternative data systems that could confirm that yes, what the GCSEs are showing is real um, and genuine improvement. The other thing finally to say is sometimes you're setting a target in order to set a priority and that will have consequences for things that are not a priority and you shouldn't feel ashamed about that, that's what priorities mean. Setting priorities is hard and that it does have the implication that some things are less important. So I'm not making that argument in relation to school sport for example, but I am making the argument that when you set a target and set a priority it will have consequences and they may be in effect what you wanted. Mm -hmm. I use a question right next to you. Uh, I didn't want to end the trend of having British people speaking. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Dr. Luke Allen. I'm a student here doing an MPH in global health. My question is, how have your positions of authority helped or hindered your ability to exercise leadership in the organisations that you've been a part of? It's, it's a nice question. And um, by the way, I'm, I'm delighted to see so many um, British students at this, at this at this at uh, this global centre of, uh, of academic leadership. So. Um, I think I mean it's it's a good question that you could talk about for 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 a, a, a long time. I think the um, I think what's 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 helped is seeing the world from a lot of different perspectives. So over the over the course of the last twenty five years, I've been a teacher union official. I've been a professor. I've worked in the Department for Education in a, an implementation capacity. I've run the delivery unit. Then I've been at McKinsey, and now I'm. Um, working as chief education advisor for a global education company and helping uh, to try and bring about a company transformation. So seeing different perspectives has been really helpful. The second thing is, and I've said this to um, many of the people who've been uh, the person I, uh, my boss effectively over the last 25 years, is I always find myself slightly on the edge of an organization as, a, as a, an internal critic. So in the delivery unit we've been talking about, I was um, technically a civil servant but seen as a, a as a Blair insider and definitely a critique a critic of the civil service but a kind of friendly critic that they 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 would say things like well Michael's all right really or you know that, that, that but even though I was driving them crazy and and you have to have so and that being on the and I, I, I'm a little bit the same inside of Pearson so I'm I'm on the executive committee I was there negotiating my budget yesterday but I'm also seen as slightly an outsider. I'm an educator that spans across lots of things. I'm a person who's been in government, um, and I'm an internal critic of trying to drive the reform faster. And the same was true when I worked in the teacher union. So I found that positioning, I, I call it being in the borderlands, actually being a good place to make change from. Um, and it means you can be an innovator and you don't get totally absorbed into the 
the system as it is because uh, a favorite phrase of Tony Blair that I totally agree with is, when you're given a task, don't accept the parameters. I'm one of those people that doesn't accept the parameters. Um, and you challenge them, and through that, pro sometimes you end up having to accept them, but you don't have to accept them at face value right at the beginning. So challenge the parameters, see yourself, see the organization in as though you're outside it, trying to make it different or on the edge of it. I found those two things extremely helpful. The, and then there's a degree of obsession, you know, the, the, which gets you the control freak, control freak <laughs> phrase. You have to obsess about the details. And I have a phrase that um, if you're about to give the benefit of the doubt, ask yourself why you're so doubtful. Generally speaking, most of the mistakes I made, and there were many in eight years in the British government, it was when I gave somebody the benefit of the doubt and actually my instinct, which didn't come from inside my head, it came from some data or something I'd heard, was there was a problem here. And generally speaking, there was a problem. Giving the benefit of doubt just delayed things and made it harder to solve in the long run. Mm -hmm. Another question? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thanks, Michael. My name is Coco. I'm an MPG student from the School of Public Health, and I'm not Britain. <laughs> and <laughs> so my question is about online education. Like currently, more and more universities are offering online courses through platforms as, such as Coursera from Stanford and the EDX from Harvard. So they definitely make education easier to access and uh, more affordable to everyone in the world. So do you expect that? Uh, such online uh, platforms will fundamentally change the future dynamics of uh, education and how? Thanks. Well, um, I, um, in, in the British Parliament, when you get uh, in, in uh, question time, one of the um, classic answers is somebody asks you a question and you say, I refer the honorable lady to my previous reply. <laughs> um, and my, my, my reply about um, the Rotel being paid with fi false dichotomies is relevant here. So I don't think that online education is going to replace face-to-face -face education. I do think that the combination of online uh, education and a range of other technologies, including the one that we're using right now, incidentally, where you can speak to people in a room and have a proper dialogue, but also uh, be accessed by people all around the world in real time and later on film. These these new combinations provide us with lots of oppo opportunity to improve the quality of education dramatically, and we need to seize them. But right now, we're not quite sure how it will work out. Um, I think that, that w w um, I've written about this in a, a document called An Avalanche is Coming, and we, what we set, set out in there is that the different functions of a university can be done by a range of different providers, and each university is going to have to work out for itself um, how to improve the quality of its teaching and learning, what it's going to be truly exceptional at. Um, I think there will be, for as far as I can see into the future and hopefully forever, lots and lots of students who want the face-to-face -face interaction with really good academic teachers who can debate ideas with them. But that doesn't mean they're all going to want to sit in uh, front of an hour-long lecture uh, and then go away. It means they, want, they might well want to watch an online lecture uh, and then have a real debate with a professor about what it means. So you, you can see all these different ways of uh, uh, of changing teaching and learning. Um, so I, I think it'll be there'll be lots of new combinations. I don't think the students coming out of schools now, as they come into universities, will tolerate sitting in lectures for an hour, uh, not really paying attention. Um, the, there's, there's some research that shows that the amount of brain activity in a student while they're in a lecture is slightly less than while they're asleep. Um, <laughs> so I'd, 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 the traditional lecture may be doomed, but face-to-face -face education, real debates about ideas, both with your peers in real time and, and with great professors, uh, it's important. Mentorship is really important. And it will be combinations of technology that transform this. So I don't think. I think the MOOCs will make a, a contribution, but I don't think that's the future that's going to replace the present. I think it's one contribution to this avalanche of change that's coming. There's a famous saying that uh, a leader without followers is a person out for a walk. Um, what do you do <laughs> when nobody follows? Um, it's, 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 a, it's a great question. And one of the things about being followed is what are you, where are you trying to go? So have you set out some kind of vision? Um, uh, secondly, there's who you are and what you're like, and whether people are willing to, to, to use a phrase from another world, get out of bed for you, as it were, and, 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 and act for you. And so the, the, the quality of the 
goal, where you're heading, and who you are and what you're like is important. And Blair was somebody we, we uh, those of us around him, really wanted to help to live that agenda, partly because we believed in him and partly because we believed in the agenda. So I think th those two things are important. And then there comes a moment when you set off and nobody really comes with you. And that's a kind of hold your nerve moment. Um, and what you, because a lot of people in a, in a change program are, when, when you first propose it, they're skeptical. Some will, a few will be totally against it. Some will think, well, they're not really going to do it. Uh, some will think it's a good idea, but it didn't work last time. And then when they see you're actually going to do it, quite a few people will say, yeah, I want to do that. But the really important thing is that, you, that your goal is clear, that you represent something people want, and then they have to believe you've got a plan that might actually work. Um, so I, I often talk about the implementation dip. You start off on one of these big things, and you've got to get through the implementation dip. And that, in, in your metaphor of the walk, that's when people might not be coming. And after a while, it works with three-year-olds, doesn't it? So those of you who have got small children, you, 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 you can turn around and say, come on, come on, and then they, they just dawdle more and more. And eventually, if you just walk on, they follow. usually follow you. <laughs> um, and I think that you've got to get nerve. <laughs> it does take nerve. It does, it, it does absolutely take nerve. Um, and I think that's, that, that is really important. And the, I think constantly t telling people where you've come from, where you're going, and what the strategy looks like. So, so that would be so your takeaway message story. to to the students here: hold your nerve. <laughs> uh, it, it would certainly be one of them. Uh, my, you know, my takeaway message would be: um, be ambitious uh, f for sure. Persist at this moment. So hold your nerve. Definitely, don't forget the data. Um, Margaret Spellings, the Republican, the, the the Bush Secretary for Education, used to say: "In God we trust. For everything else, we need data." I think it's really important. <laughs> and finally. Um, have integrity, because in the end, people have got to believe in you as a person if you're going to be a leader, and what you're like and how you relate to people, and integrity of the goal, but also integrity of how you go about delivering the goal. Mm. Michael, thank you. It has been an, an absolute delight, and, and I think extremely informative uh, to all of us. I have known you for some time, but I've learned a great deal uh, from you here today, um, and I hope that everybody else has. Um, those of you who want to talk to Michael beyond this conversation can tweet him uh, on at Michael Barber 9, at Michael Barber 9, and he apparently responds to all friendly tweets. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and we remind you that the series continues next year, beginning again in January with uh, Dr. Leslie Ramsamy, who is the Agricultural Minister from Guyana, and the date will be advertised shortly. Thank you all for being here. Thank Happy you, holidays. Michael. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.